Hello. This is John T. Rhapsody's Esquire, purveyor of awesome old-school audio stories, bringing you a funny one today from 1908 by O. Henry called The Chair of Philanthro Mathematics. William Sidney Porter, writing under the pen name O. Henry, walked the earth from 1862 to 1910. Hear the words of old. The Chair of Philanthro Mathematics from 1908 by O. Henry I see that the cause of education has received the princely gift of more than fifty millions of dollars, said I. I was gleaning the stray items from the evening papers while Jeff Peters packed his briar pipe with plug cut. Which same, said Jeff, calls for a new deck and a recitation by the entire class in philanthro mathematics. Is that an illusion? I asked. It is, said Jeff. I never told you about the time when me and Andy Tucker was philanthropists, did I? It was eight years ago in Arizona. Andy and me was out in the Gila Mountains with a two-horse wagon prospecting for silver. We struck it and sold out to parties in Tucson for $25,000. They paid our check at the bank in silver, a thousand dollars in a sack. We loaded it in our wagon and drove east a hundred miles before we recovered our presence of intellect. Now, $25,000 doesn't sound like so much when you're reading the annual report of the Pennsylvania Railroad or listening to an actor talking about his salary. But when you can raise up a wagon sheet and kick around your boot heel and hear every one of them ring against another, it makes you feel like you was a night and day bank with the clock striking 12. The third day out, we drove into one of the most specious and tidy little towns that Nature or Rand and McNally ever turned out. It was in the foothills and mitigated with trees and flowers and about 2,000 head of cordial and dilatory inhabitants. The town seemed to be called Floresville, and Nature had not contaminated it with many railroads, fleas, or eastern tourists. Me and Andy deposited our money to the credit of Peters and Tucker and the Esperanza Savings Bank and got rooms at the Skyview Hotel. After supper, we lit up and sat out on the gallery and smoked. Then was when the philanthropy idea struck me. I suppose every grafter gets it sometime. When a man swindles the public out of a certain amount, he begins to get scared and wants to return part of it. And if you'll watch close and notice the way his charity runs, you'll see that he tries to restore it to the same people he got it from. As a hydrostatical case, take, let's say, A. A made his millions selling oil to poor students who sit up nights studying political economy and methods for regulating the trusts. So, Back to the universities and colleges goes his conscience dollars. There's B got his from the common laboring man that works with his hands and tools. How's he to get some of the remorse fun back into their overalls? Aha, says B. I'll do it in the name of education. I've skinned the laboring man, says he to himself, but... According to the old proverb, charity covers a multitude of sins. So, he puts up $80 million worth of libraries, and the boys with the dinner pail that bills them gets the benefit. Where's the books? asks the reading public. I dinna ken, says B. I offered you libraries, and there they are. I suppose if I'd given you preferred steel trust stock instead... You'd have wanted the water in it set out and cut glass to canners. Hoot for you. But, as I said, 
the owning of so much money was beginning to give me philanthropitis. It was the first time me and Andy had ever made a pile big enough to make us stop and think how we got it. Andy, says I, we're wealthy. Not beyond the dreams of the average, but in our humble way, we are comparatively rich. I feel as if I'd like to do something for, as well as to, humanity. I was thinking the same thing, Jeff, says he. We've been gouging the public for a long time, with all kinds of little schemes from selling self-igniting celluloid collars to flooding Georgia with Hoke Smith presidential campaign buttons. I'd like, myself, to hedge a bet or two in the graph game if I could do it without actually banging the Cymbalines and the Salvation Army or teaching a Bible class by the Bertillon system, referring to a system invented by a French criminologist for identifying criminals by certain physical attributes. What'll we do, says Andy? Give free grub to the poor, or send a couple of thousand dollars to George Curtleyu, who was the Treasury Secretary at the time under Theodore Roosevelt? Neither, says I. We've got too much money to be implicated in plain charity, and we haven't got enough to make restitution. So, we'll look about for something that's about halfway between the two. The next day in walking around Floresville, we see on a hill a big red brick building that appears to be disinhabited. The citizens speak up and tell us that it was begun for a residence several years before by a mine owner. After running up the house, he finds he only had $2.80 left to furnish it with, so he invests that in whiskey and jumps off the roof on a spot where he now resquiescats in pieces. As soon as me and Andy saw that building, the same idea struck both of us. We would fix it up with lights and pen wipers and professors, and put an iron dog and statues of Hercules and Father John on the lawn, and start one of the finest free educational institutions in the world right there. So we talks it over to the prominent citizens of Floresville, who falls in fine with the idea. They give a banquet in the engine house to us, and we make our bow for the first time as benefactors to the cause of progress and enlightenment. Andy makes an hour and a half speech on the subject of irrigation in Lower Egypt, and we have a moral tune on the phonograph and pineapple sherbet. Andy and me didn't lose any time in philanthropin. We put every man in town that could tell a hammer from a stepladder to work on the building, dividing it up into classrooms and lecture halls. We wired a Frisco for a carload of desks, footballs, arithmetics, pen holders, dictionaries, chairs for the professors, slates, skeletons, sponges, 27 cravenetted gowns and caps for the senior class, and an open order for all the truck that goes with a first-class university. I took it on myself to put a campus and a curriculum on the list but the telegraph operator must have got the words wrong, being an ignorant man, for when the goods come, we found a can of peas and a curry comb among them. While the weekly papers was having chalk plate cuts of me and Andy, we wired an employment agency in Chicago to express us, FOB, six professors immediately. One English literature, one up-to-date dead languages, one chemistry, one political economy, Democrat preferred, one logic, and one wise to painting Italian and music with union card. The Esperanza Bank guaranteed salaries, which was to run between $800 and $800.50. Well, sir, we finally got it in shape. Over the front door was carved the words, 
The World's University, Peters and Tucker, Patrons and Proprietors. And when September the 1st got a cross mark on the calendar, the come-ons begun to roll in. First, the faculty got off the tri-weekly express from Tucson. They was mostly young, spectacled, and red-headed, with sentiments divided between ambition and food. Andy and me got them billeted on the floor's villains and then laid for the students. They came in bunches. We had advertised the university and all the state papers, and it did us good to see how quick the country responded. 219 husky lads, aging along from 18 up to chin whiskers, answered the clarion call of free education. They ripped open that town, sponged the seams, turned it, lined it with new mohair. And you couldn't have told it from Harvard or Goldfields at the March term of court. They marched up and down the streets waving flags with the world's university colors, ultramarine and blue, and they certainly made a lively place of Floresville. Andy made them a speech from the balcony of the Skyview Hotel, and the whole town was out celebrating. In about two weeks, the professors got the students disarmed and herded into classes. I don't believe there's any pleasure equal to being a philanthropist. Me and Andy bought high silk hats and pretended to dodge the two reporters of the Floresville Gazette. The paper had a man to Kodak us whenever we appeared on the street and ran our pictures every week over the column-headed educational notes. Andy lectured twice a week at the university, and afterward I would rise and tell a humorous story. Once the Gazette printed my pictures with Abe Lincoln on one side and Marshall P. Wilder on the other. Andy was as interested in philanthropy as I was. We used to wake up of nights and tell each other new ideas for booming the university. Andy, says I to him one day, there's something we overlooked. The boys ought to have dromedaries. What's that? Andy asks. Why, something to sleep in, of course, says I. All colleges have them. Oh, you mean pajamas, says Andy. I do not, says I. I mean dromedaries. But I never could make Andy understand, so we never ordered them. Of course, I meant them long bedrooms in colleges where the scholars sleep in a row. Well, sir, the world's university was a success. We had scholars from five states and territories, and Floresville had a boom. A new shooting gallery and a pawn shop and two more saloons started, and the boys got up a college yell that went this way. Raw, raw, raw. Dun, dun, dun. Peters, Tucker, lots of fun. Bow, wow, wow. Haw, hee, haw. World University, hip, hurrah. The scholars was a fine lot of young men, and me and Andy was as proud of them as if they belonged to our own family. But one day, about the last of October, Andy comes to me and asks if I have any idea how much money we had left in the bank. I guess it's about 16000 our balance, says Andy, is $821.62. What? says I, with a kind of yell. Do you mean to tell me that them infernal, clod-hopping, dough-headed, pup-faced, goose-brained, gate-stealing, rabbit ear sons of horse thieves have soaked us for that much? No less, says Andy. Then... To Helvetia with philanthropy, says I. Not necessarily, says Andy. Philanthropy, says he, when run on a good business basis, 
is one of the best graphs going. I'll look into the matter and see if it can be straightened out. The next week, I'm looking over the payroll of our faculty when I run across a new name, Professor James Darnley McCorkle, Chair of Mathematics, salary $100 per week. I yell so loud that Andy runs in quick. What's this? says I. A professor of mathematics at more than $5,000 a year? How did this happen? Did he get in through the window and appoint himself? I wired to Frisco for him a week ago, says Andy. In order in the faculty, we seem to have overlooked the chair of mathematics. A good thing we did, says I. We can pay his salary two weeks, and then our philanthropy will look like the ninth hole on the Skibo golf links. Wait a while, says Andy and see how things turn out. We have taken up too noble a cause to draw out now. Besides, the further I gaze into the retail philanthropy business, the better it looks to me. I never thought about investigating it before. Come to think of it now, goes on Andy, all the philanthropists I ever knew had plenty of money. I ought to have looked into that matter long ago and located which was the cause in which was the effect. I had confidence in Andy's chicanery and financial affairs, so I left the whole thing in his hands. The university was flourishing fine, and me and Andy kept our silk hats shined up, and Floresville kept on heaping honors on us like we was millionaires instead of almost busted philanthropists. The students kept the town lively and prosperous. Some stranger came to town and started a faro bank over the Red Front livery stable and began to amass money in quantities. Me and Andy strolled up one night and piked a dollar or two for sociability. There were about 50 of our students there, drinking rum punches and shoving high stacks of blues and reds about the table as the dealer turned the cards up. Why, dang it, Andy, says I, these free school hunting, gander headed, silk socked little sons of sap suckers have got more money than you and me ever had. Look at the rolls they're pulling out of their pistol pockets. Yes, says Andy, a good many of them are sons of wealthy miners and stockmen. It's very sad to see them wasting their opportunities this way. At Christmas, all the students went home to spend the holidays. We had a farewell blowout at the university, and Andy lectured on modern music and prehistoric literature of the archipelagos. Each one of the faculty answered to toasts and compared me and Andy to Rockefeller and the Emperor Marcus Autolycus. I pounded on the table and yelled for Professor McCorkle, but it seems he wasn't present on the occasion. I wanted to look at the man that Andy thought could earn $100 a week in philanthropy that was on the point of making an assignment. The students all left on the night train, and the town sounded as quiet as the campus of a correspondence school at midnight. When I went to the hotel, I saw a light in Andy's room, and I opened the door and walked in. There sat Andy and the faro dealer at a table, dividing a two-foot-high stack of currency in thousand-dollar packages. Correct, says Andy. Thirty-one thousand apiece. Come in, Jeff, says he. This is our share of the profits of the first half of the scholastic term of the world's university, incorporated and philanthropated. Are you convinced now, says Andy, that philanthropy, when practiced in a business way, is an art that blesses him who gives as well as him who receives? Great, says I, feeling fine. I'll admit you are the doctor this time. We'll be leaving on the morning train, 
says Andy. You'd better get your collars and cuffs and press clippings together. Great, says I. I'll be ready. But Andy, says I. I wish I could have met that Professor James Darnley McCorkle before we went. I had a curiosity to know that man. That'll be easy, said Andy, turning around to the faro dealer. Jim, says Andy, shake hands with Mr. Peters. And that concludes O. Henry's 1908 story called The Chair of Philanthro Mathematics. This is John T. Rhapsody's Esquire, purveyor of awesome old-school audio stories. Thank you for listening. You can find more stories like this in the channel's playlists. Find them by staying tuned for the last 20 seconds of this video and clicking on the end screen icons. You can also go to the channel homepage and click on the playlist tab. If you enjoyed this story and would like to hear more, please help me earn the warm embrace of Mr. and Mrs. YouTubes who look with loving favor upon those channels whose listeners faithfully download the YouTube app, create an account, subscribe to this channel, like, comment, click the notification bell, and share the videos with their friends so that they too can hear the words of old.